Hey guys, welcome to the Daily Word Bible Study, a plain and simple book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse study through the entire Bible. We are in Isaiah chapter 35, and um, I am going to try to get through chapters 35 through 37. One reason is, um, I know that's going to be ambitious, I, I, and truthfully, I don't know if I'll be able to make it. Uh, the reason why I'm going to try to hurry through it is because it is a section where Hezekiah, Isaiah, is going to confront the Assyrians' attempt to conquer them. And I, and I think the king of Assyria is feeling himself. He's, he, he has just conquered Israel, the northern kingdoms. And of course, not realizing that it was God, the one who gave him the victory. And so, um, and so they, they, they bring this vast army against Judah under King Hezekiah's um, um, reign. So like I can say, I'm going to see if I can get through it. I don't know. Because um, there's one chapter we have to cover. Um, there's one chapter we have to cover uh, first, and then we'll get to that story. So I'm going to jump right in it. Uh, here we go. Chapter, th <laughs> excuse me, chapter 35. Um, the wilderness and the dry land will be glad. The desert will rejoice and blossom like a rose. It will blossom abundantly and will also rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of of the Lord and the splendor of our God. Strength, strengthen the weak hands, steady and shaky knees. Say to the cowardly, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God, vengeance is coming. God's retribution is coming. He will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf will be unstopped, and the lame will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy, for water will gush in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Now, this um, this is a, I, I think we could safely say, a prophecy that is, what is called the near fulfillment and then the far fulfillment. The near fulfillment would be when Jesus come, he will do all of these things. He will open the eyes of the blind, unstop the deaf ears, the lame will leap like a deer, the tongue when the mute will sing for joy. Now this the far fulfillment of this will come in the millennial reign, uh, the thousand year reigns, which will happen at the second coming of Jesus. Verse 7 says, The parched ground will become a pool of water, and the thirsty land spring of water. In the haunt of jackals, in their lyres, there will be grass, reeds, and papyrus. By the way, this, this papyrus is the plant which most of the original letters were written on. They would dry these plants out, and of course they would make long, they, they eventually would become scrolls. And they would make these, they would dry them out and then they would take, to make ink, it wasn't like our ink, but it was something sm like a smudge from things like um, charcoal, um, uh, soot, things like that, that they would uh, mush up, okay? Uh, and for that reason, that's why we don't have uh, any of the original, let's say, letters of Paul, okay? For example, the, the New Testament uh, writings. We have copies of copies of copies, but not the originals because of this particular uh, weak <laughs> plant or paper. Eight. A road will be there <clears throat> in a way it will be called the holy way. And the unclean will not travel on it, but it would be for the ones who walk the path. Even the fool will not go astray. Um there will be no lion there, and no vicious beast will go up on it. 
They will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk on it. And the redeemed of the Lord will return and come from Zion with singing, crowded with unending joy. Joy and gladness will overtake it. I will take them. And sorrow and singing will flee. Now, I'm going to slow down. I, again, I said I, I know I said I wanted to try to get through um, these four chapters, but uh, I, I'm going to say this is this chapter here gives a, it's too good to go through like that. Um, so I'm going to slow it down and just deal with this picture of the second coming. And the reason why I want to say that is because there's a couple of things I want to address with this. And, and the reason why, because what made me come to mind, I deal a lot with responding to atheist uh, videos. I respond to them. <clears throat> I don't mind having discussions with them. I don't mind having discourse with them. Um, but one of the questions that they oftentimes will ask is, well, you know, can we prove the existence of God? And my response to that is, no, we cannot prove the existence of God. Now, one of the ways that, and, and so this event, now, one, this, remember, this writing is eight, about 800 years before Jesus coming, I mean, his birth. So, um, and we're still, this picture here is yet in the future, right, from our perspective. Now, when we see a prophecy like this, here's the thing that I would say. One, it is not up to me to prove the existence of God. And I think Christians foolishly tr attempt to give evidence that will, in their mind, say, this is evidence um, for the existence of God. And it is not. And they get creamed horribly. They get stomped on horribly, but horribly um, because they can't prove it. What they think is a good argument for a defense of the gospel is only accepted among, let's say, Christians. So, you know, for example, if I if I talk about the rapture of the church, which is a, a big contested, you know, debate among Christians, you know, uh, my the amen comes when from those who agree with, you know, the rapture argument. It doesn't hold true if I if someone doesn't agree with the rapture. Well, the same thing. If, if you got people that don't agree with any of the gospel, then this prophecy doesn't work. In fact. If I may borrow from Paul, prophecy is for the believer. Tongues is a sign for the unbeliever. Now, I'm saying all of that because when we look at this prophecy here, when we look at the prophecy, um, this is a picture of, again, how the events will unfold. Now, um, if we kind of go back... <coughs> to chapter 36 when he talks about the judgment against Edom and uh, uh, I'll take a think here and he uh, oh <clears throat> all right if you come down to verse 8 when he says for the for the Lord has a day of vengeance right? A day of vengeance. Then it says the time of paying back Edom. So this is what this this here. This is the judgment against Edom, right? Um, and then you come down to uh, where he talks about the land of Edom will be laid waste. So then it comes to verse thirty-five, and it says the wilderness and the dry land will be glad, and the desert will rejoice and blossom like a rose. So it he he goes from the judgment and how the land will lay waste, right, 
to the wilderness and the dry land will be glad. So there's a couple of things about the second coming of Jesus. And, and, and in time, we talk about Bible prophecy. Because one, it always centers around what is going on in Israel. So first of all, what is going on today in Israel has nothing to do with prophecy. It, people have misguided hope. The nation of Israel today, as it is called, <coughs> the nation of Israel today don't even worship God. I, I think it, it, is a, it is a secular nation. The, the nation of Israel today, uh, it, they're more liberal than America, which is odd because you never see a, you never see evangelicals condemning Israel. And one reason why is because to them, it, you know, they would say that Israel is God's the apple of God's eye. So you you can't you can't be against Israel, you know. As a, as God made the promise, I will curse those who curse you, and I will bless those who bless you. So kind of a, of a foreign policy, um, they, you know, they would say, well, America, you need to be on the side of Israel if you want God's blessing. The problem with that, the problem with that is that God is not on the side of Israel now. Israel today is cut off from God. So how does that fit? Right? How, how does that fit? And whenever I ask this question, um, I never get an answer. <laughs> I never get an answer. I never get an answer. Um, and, and, and so my, here's my point. Uh, there is going to come a day when God will gather Israel back to his land. God will give the land back. God will show up. Okay? God will show up. When, when people ask me about why does God allow evil, well, that's a question he may or may not answer when he shows up. Here's the thing. He's going to show up. So when he shows up, he is going to physically take back the planet. And Israel will be the capital. Okay? Israel will be the capital. And in a sense, this is what he's saying here. He says, the wilderness and the dry land will be glad. The desert will rejoice and blossom like a rose. It will blossom abundantly. It will also rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Now, this is referred, again, to when Jesus comes back. And when he comes back physically, there will be physical things that will happen. Well, some of the things that will happen is the land will be, again, restored. And then he said, verse 3, strengthen the weak hands, steady the shaking hands, say to the cowardly, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. Vengeance is coming. God's retribution is coming. He will save you. And so as Israel is about to be destroyed, Again, this is yet to come. So you can't try to, I think it's a mistake to always have a newspaper in one hand and to try to decipher Bible prophecy in the other. This is talking about a very specific event. Now, that said, if you wanted to have a near fulfillment, it would be in verse 7. Uh when he talks about verse 5, uh, beginning with verse 5, when the eyes of the blind will be open and the ears of the deaf unstopped, then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy. For the, uh, for water will gush in the wilderness and stream in the desert. I'll come back to that statement in a moment. But notice, again, the only person who could fulfill this would be the Messiah. So when did the Messiah fulfill this Let's say the first time. Well, Jesus did these things. He did he did these things in terms of opening eyes of the blind. Now, another thing when we talk about the near and far fulfillment of prophecy, when Jesus said when he healed a blind man at the beginning of his ministry, he said, "This scripture has been fulfilled in your eyes." Right? This this, this scripture has been fulfilled, and and and, and they freaked out over that. But he, he said this. What he did not say is that he did not talk about the day of vengeance. 
when he came the first time, he talked about the Savior. He demonstrated the acts. He demonstrated um, the, the qualities of the Savior. And so one of those acts as the Messiah, as the Savior, is that the eyes, the, the, the miraculous signs will be done, the benevolent acts of kindness and sign towards those that are suffering. And he fulfilled that. So verse 5 again says, then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ear of the deaf will be unstopped. The lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy for water will gush in the wilderness and streams in the desert. So here's that. This did not happen during Jesus' time, meaning the gush of water in the wilderness and streams in the desert. That didn't happen. The healings happened. The declaring of the good news to the poor happened. Right? Um, so, but in both cases, only Jesus could have fulfilled that. In that manner. Okay? In that manner. Verse 7 says, the parched ground will become a pool of water and the thirsty lands spring of water. Land springs of water. So we always hear this phrase, you know, the deserts will bloom. And this is again, when Jesus comes, then the wastelands of the earth, I'm thinking about it, there will be no more climate change debate. Okay. No more climate change debate. Jesus is going to radically change the earth. I'm and I would be curious about a lot of land that lays waste, the North and South Pole, Greenland. I don't know if you even realize, like Russia. Russia, a lot of it, I'm, a great portion of its land is waste. I mean, they, they span almost two or three continents, the length. And yet, I think Russia maybe has 100 million, 150 million people. But that's going to all change when Jesus comes. That's all going to change when Jesus comes. And so life will, will there's going to be another prophecy where it talks about a young child will live I think we already covered that, a young child. Uh, a child who dies at a, a, a person who dies at 100 would be considered a baby. They'd be like, wow, he died, so, he died so young. He was only 100 years old. And that's because, again, when the presence of the Lord comes, how much better life will be. He says, and there would be, and a robe would be there. Uh, and a way it would be called the holy way. The unclean would not travel on it, but it would be for the one who walks the path. And then he said, even a fool would not go astray. Then he said, there would be no lion there, or no vicious beast would go upon it. And they would not be found there. They would not be found there, but the redeemed will walk on it. And the redeemed of the Lord will return and come to Zion with singing crowned with unending joy. Joy and gladness will overtake him, and sorrow and sighing will flee. So that's the image or the picture of what is to come, the coming master or the coming Messiah. Okay, that will come. Um, so there is a lot to the future that God has in store uh, for us, a lot. And um, okay, but <laughs> um, a little sidetrack. Uh, uh, don't forget to like and share this video and subscribe to VP the Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought, a comment, add it to the comment section below. All comments are welcome. Until next time, I'll see you then.